Good Monday, everyone. Welcome to the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com Rocky Top Rewind Podcast. Glad, glad to have you along with us and uh, hope you're having a great start to your week. And let's talk about this game, the 1997 SEC Championship game in Atlanta, Tennessee's first trip to Atlanta, the George Dome for the SEC Championship. The Volunteers heavy favorites. They fall behind big to Auburn, uh, but come back and rally for a win. Uh, watching this game, guys, the first thing that jumps out to me was how poorly Tennessee played in this game and how fortunate uh, that they were to win the game. I, I remember that it, the Marcus Nash play, and we'll talk to Marcus Nash a little bit later in the podcast about that play and uh, how it came about and it, talk about just – the halftime speech and some of the stories that have grown in stature afterwards. But going back and rewatching it, guys, just Tennessee played really poorly in this game. I mean, offensively, they were about a train wreck for three quarters or so of this football game. What stood out to you guys? Keith Jackson stood out to me first off. Oh my God, what a, what a, what an absolute treasure he was. But to your point, I remember it being sloppy. I didn't remember there being six turnovers. That really was. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing to think Tennessee won an SEC championship game when they turned the ball over six times. And, you know, Auburn turned a, a good chunk of those into, into points. I mean, one of immediately on the uh, fumble recovery run back. But that's, I mean, that's got to be what jumps out at you. Is they, you know, Tennessee scored 30 points in a game where they turned it over six times, which tells you how explosive they were on offense. Well, well for me, I, you know, I don't remember Auburn being ranked as high as they were. But, again, I mean, I was, was it, 97, I was 14 at the time. So, I mean, like, I, I knew they had some solid players. I didn't remember them being 11th. So, you know, but you're right. The open with Keith Jackson. Uh, one other thing that stood out to me in this game was if, if you go back to the, to the Peyton Manning interception that gets returned down and Auburn eventually scores. Oh, yeah. Uh, the I, I worked this down. Sean Bryson chasing that guy down. I mean, you had Jamal chasing him he down and Sean Bryson. Jamal. And Sean Bryson looked like a, a shot out of a cannon. I mean, most underrated player for the Vols in 97 and 98 because he was a tailback who they moved to running back or, or they moved to fullback. And obviously he makes the play in 98 against Florida. That was the difference make maker. But I mean, one of the most unselfish football players and made an unselfish play, obviously there. Jesse, I've watched a lot of football. I didn't remember this until I went back and rewatched it. I don't know that I've ever seen a player fumble punt returns on back to back returns the way Terry Fair did in this well, game. I, I, I've never seen anything like that. And then be allowed to keep returning them. <laughs> he was good, though. There, Terry, Phillip put Terry back out there after fumbling on back-to-back -back possessions. And then Terry ended up, you know, having uh, a huge return. Ter Terry and Nash and a couple of the guys I thought for Tennessee really kind of made colossal mistakes, but then turned some of those mistakes into kind of comeback heroic plays. Nash fumbled twice. You, you wonder if the first one – uh, again, we rewatch these old games. It's hilarious to think what what they what might happen on some of these plays with replay. Um, but Terry Ferris fumbled. I thought to me the key moment of the entire game, watching it, knowing how it was ultimately going to play out, was the second fumble that he had. Auburn takes over at the tw at Tennessee's twenty eight. Tennessee's defensive line thought Raynock Thompson, you know, made some big plays from from the edge at linebacker. And then, you know, even uh, Darwin Walker making some plays. But they forced three straight incompletions. Damian Craig was part of the reason Auburn did not win this game. He could, Other than hitting a few just like Hail Mary throws, could not hit the broad side of a barn. Uh, and so they go three and out there. Kicker misses a field goal. Tennessee survives. That would have that would have put Auburn up by another uh, at least three points minimum. You, Peyton comes back with the sidearm sling to to Price, and it, the comeback was kind of on from there. I tell you what, really stood out to me, Brent, yeah. was the fact that you were at 59 combined points with 11 minutes to go and change, and no one scored again. In, in today's football, that, I don't think that would happen. But back then, it was just a different game. I mean, the, the things so, things are so much more offensively driven. Even with Peyton running the show, um, I it was, really I don't again, and that's another thing I don't remember. You know, dating back, you know, 23 years is, you know, that Marcus Nash's play, I thought in my mind was like five, six minutes to go. No, it was 11. So that last 11 minutes goes scoreless. Well, and, and Auburn just, I mean, if Tennessee does a gift wrap some stuff for Auburn, they don't score because contrary to what, you know, Greasy and Jackson are talking about throughout the whole game about Damian Craig, Damian Craig, Jesse's right. He missed a bunch of open throws and they had no run game. 
So Tennessee was just teeing off there. I, I did appreciate the fact that um, Bob Greasy reminded everybody about 16 times in the broadcast that Tennessee magically found Jamal Lewis in game once number four of the season. The game, yeah. <laughs> yeah, once they found him they in, the found him in the fourth season fourth of the game. game. I, I, went and look, I went and looked this up. Um, Tennessee in their first two games of the season outscored Texas A&M and UCLA 82-41. to And in those eight quarters of play, Rob Lewis, Jamal Lewis got 10 touches for 51 yards. He averaged five yards a carry in those two games, and then he goes to Florida, and, and he's not ready to play. So that, that remains one of the monikers of the 97 season. No yeah. kid. I mean, you wonder what would happen. I mean, I don't think they beat Florida, but I mean, you, you, you wonder, and you know, again, Lewis wasn't here all summer long to get ready. And there was the whole notion of protecting Peyton and, and pass protection. And clearly Jamal struggled even in this game. When you go back and look at it, he missed a couple of pass protections. He missed a couple of checks. One resulted in a fumble. Actually, two of them resulted in a fumble because one, he fumbled it. And the other, he knocked, I think, knocked the ball out of Peyton's hand. So there were clearly still some issues there. Uh, but there's no doubt he was obviously Tennessee's best runner on that. The other thing that stood out to me was watching Leonard Little drop into pass coverage as a middle linebacker instead of an edge rusher. Now, he ended up playing as the game went on off the edge more and more, uh, but he was, a, he was a fish out of water at middle linebacker for this team compared to what he had done in his career as a defensive end up to that point. But Tennessee gets um, the, gets the win. They get an SEC championship and set the stage moving forward because they're going to play Nebraska uh, for a national championship or a potential share of it to get blown out there. But it sets the stage uh, for for the next year in a national championship, Jesse. Uh, yeah, it, it, in the big picture, that's obviously the, the, the key takeaway from this game. I think just from watching an old school football game or, you know, we've gone from 92 to several in 97 now, it is funny to just see schematically how how much more advanced things are now. Tennessee, I mean, got a couple of these touchdowns just because Auburn stubbornly just stuck into, like, covered one, you know, man-to-man defense. Nash breaks a tackle, and it's a touchdown. Peerless Price breaks a a tackle, and it's a touchdown. The first two plays, Price actually caught the one, and then he actually had another one that went right through his hands that would have been either a long gain or a touchdown. Man-to-man defense, no help. Auburn's just playing cover one. I thought that it was like, you know, th- that stood out to me a lot, too, that it was, you know, Peyton immediately diagnosed that he always had an advantage on the edge. And it was like, no, let's go out there. Now, he did not always make the play or sometimes he got burned with a receiver popping the ball up and Auburn catching it going the other way. Uh, but it was a pretty simple game plan by Auburn, it seemed like. And Tennessee just took advantage. I th- I'm, I'm, gonna, go I'm just going to go back to Jamal for a minute. And, and I've said this before that I mean after you get past Herschel and Bo, he's as good as anybody I've ever seen in this league. Now you know, he had the injury, missed a year, left early, so he doesn't have the numbers, you know, to back that up. But I put him up there with anybody I've seen and that you know it goes That's back to nineteen eighty four, eighty five. I mean I, when he was at his best, I don't I mean I'll I'll listen to Leonard Fournette arguments or you know, Todd Gurley, but I mean he's right there. He in, in that next level to me, right behind, right behind Herschel and Bo. Well, I think what, what Jamal, to validate your argument, I think you look at what he did in the NFL. To, to go for over 2,000 yards in the NFL has been done, what, five times? You know, I mean, you just – so, I mean, that's that's in the NFL. So, I mean, and I, I'm, to me, you can – you can you, to me, that's the validation for what he's, Rob's trying to say there. He's To me, to me I, I don't think he has the heights of some of the other guys, even a guy like Derrick Henry. But in this game, prove that he is the ultimate workhorse. He didn't have a run over 17 yards in this game. But they gave it to him 31 times, and he finished with 125 yards uh, because he just grinded out four and five yards, you know, on every run. And that's how AP, you know, there was all that barrage of scoring because of the turnovers and whatnot early. And then they pretty much just handed him the ball in the fourth quarter and said, take us home. Yeah. I'll say this about Jamal. Um, and – I, he, he is among the best I've ever covered and the best I've seen, Rob. I, I, I think the argument that you make is certainly you, you. I mean, it's one that would always be debated, no, no question. The one that it won't be debated to me is I've not seen a, a more complete offensive player or a more complete physically put together offensive player 
step off the bus as a freshman in, in August the way he did. I mean, he looked like an NFL back when he got off the bus. I mean, you watch him in this game against Auburn. Yeah, he didn't have, as you said, Jesse, he didn't have long runs. You know, they didn't pop him for anything. Uh, but from a physical standpoint, he looked he looked like an NFL back then. And you got to remember, in that game, he's 18 years old playing against Auburn. I mean, he was he was certainly a a man among boys. I, I think the other thing that stands out to me in this game, bigger picture, is just the young talent and the speed that Tennessee had on defense. I mean, I mean when you talk about Raynock, you talk about Al, you start to see a little bit of Deion Grant show up Jonathan there. Jonathan Brown, you know, Jonathan Brown was a, a you know a veteran on that team, but Tennessee could run. And you talk about where they're trying to get to defensively. Um, and I know Jeremy Pruitt wants his team bigger and wants his defense bigger. But the best thing that Tennessee's defenses did in the 90s, to me, is they ran. They they could run with anybody, uh, play in space with anybody. They were I mean, those, uh, those linebackers were as athletic as you'll see. Now, Al Wilson would have been out of this game in the first quarter. Uh, <laughs> he would not have played. Uh, he would have been done because – he spent he spent his entire career going high at the head of somebody, and he got Damian Craig maybe on the first possession of the game or the second possession of the game. The he's jump gone. pass that he yeah the jump pass that Craig completed. Yeah, I mean he's gone because I mean he that is that is helmet crown of the helmet into the face mask, and he's gone. He would have led the team in targeting calls in his Tennessee career if that rule was in place uh, at, at the time. That, no, and, no, Brent, no doubt your- about that. To your point about the speed, I think, you know, the, the previous two games we watched were both from 96, really good Tennessee teams. I think you can see a dramatic difference in the defensive speed with this group once you get, you know, Tyrone Hines out, out of there, you know, Ray, Ray Knock in there. I, I, I think the, the back, just a, a really significant, obvious difference. Late. And, and again, the Ohio State game was sloppy and that, that was part of it. But the way this team ran to the football, the difference in just a year to me was, was pretty clear. Well, it's and again, it's the speed of the linebackers. It's the ability of the linebackers to run that that jumps out. Now, Tennessee's linebackers were undersized. Raynock Thompson played much bigger than he weighed. You know, Al Wilson played bigger than he was size wise, and that's why Tennessee was so good at those positions because they played bigger from a physical standpoint. That they played bigger than what they did. I'll tell you something else that jumped out in this game. Takeo Spikes was a pretty dang good football player oh, yeah. too. Holy cow! He, he also <laughs> validated it in the NFL. Yeah, he did. He was he was he played didn't play on great teams, but that that guy could play. I mean, he and Jamal Lewis, I mean, they collided a few times in the hole, and there were there was some man there was some man punching going on, some man hitting going on in in, in that game. Um, the the other thing too that 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 I mean, I remember about this game and and being there, you know, to to cover it and and um, setting up for it and everything. The atmosphere of those games is is crazy. I mean, it, it's crazy good and. You know, I thought Tennessee, for a veteran team, struggled to communicate more than Auburn did in this game. I mean, you've got, you've got Peyton, the savvy deal. Tennessee had a lot of communication issues. You could tell on the sidelines they had a hard time even talking to each other because it was so loud in there. I think the noise level bothered Tennessee's offense in this game uh, a good bit and, and probably rattled them to a certain degree as well. And, and I think that's one of the, the, the creations of Roy Kramer of putting that thing in Atlanta and dividing it up 50-50 the way they did, it, it created one of the best atmospheres in December that, that everybody, every co- conference in college football was trying to mimic and has been trying to, you know, trying to get the same thing. Nobody, to my, in my opinion, has equated that when you talk about championship games. You know, well, I, don't so, think, I don't think, I think everybody else, there's, there's such a travel I think it helped that, that Atlanta, for the most part, when you think about the teams that were routinely there, you know, Tennessee during this time, Florida, obviously, to this point, had, had been the team that had been in the SC championship game every year. Um, you know, eventually Georgia gets there. They're right down the road. Auburn is a stone's throw from Atlanta. Like, you look at these other conferences, the Pac-12, they just give it to the team that has the best record, and they host. I mean, that's, you know, you know what it is. I mean, even like the Big 12, I mean, there's a significant travel. Um, good point. You know, for, it is. for all those teams compared to, I mean, even like teams in Texas, like when the game, you know, if the game was in Texas, you could have to drive four, five, six hours, much less leave the state. So I, I think that's that helped all during that time. I mean, what was Florida, was, what, five hours, six hours? Jesse, what's Gainesville to Atlanta? Yeah, like five and a half. Five hours. I mean, LSU's probably the longest team that made it. I mean, Mississippi State, when they made it in 98. 
I mean, geographically, it's just pretty it just close to everything. It just means more, AP. <laughs> it does just mean more. Maybe maybe that's a part. Maybe that's a part of it as well. Here's here's the other thing that was born out of this game, and that's the leadership of Al Wilson. Uh, and this is not on the tape. You can't watch this on the TV copy. Uh, but anybody you talk to, and, and Marcus Nash will will comment on this as well. Uh, the halftime, the, the adjustments were were not adjustments at the half. Basically, Al Wilson stood up and took over the locker room and called out Peyton Manning in the locker room and called out the receivers for for fumbling the football and dropping the football. And it was it was not a coach's adjustment halftime. It was a player led adjustment, and it was all about mentality. And it was led by a young Al Wilson that would carry over into 98 for his leadership as well. But that's the night that the legend of Al Wilson was born because he was calling out some NFL dudes and had no problem doing it in the locker room. To a man, everybody you talk to will talk about how intense that locker room was. And clearly Tennessee played better in the second half on both sides of the ball than they did in the first half of this game. So it had an impact without any question about that. Because Al was pretty good. He was pretty loud that, for, for sure about that. All right, so before we talk to, to, to Marcus Nash here, any, any final thoughts and kind of watching this game and looking over it? Anybody got I, anything? I just want to say, I mean, off the top, one thing, I, I don't know what broadcast you watched, but the one, the way mine, the one I watched was cut. The first three Tennessee players I, that I saw on the screen or heard mentioned were Peyton, Jamal Lewis, Leonard Little, three guys that went on to to be, you know, win Super Bowls and be a big part of Super Bowl winning teams. And I think that just, you know, it says a lot about how, how stacked they were at that point in time. Yeah, they I mean, were, I they think were, it was those three. It was, it was, you know, many, many more. I mean, yeah, but, I, mean, I just know. thought it was interesting that that's the those are the first three that Keith Jackson either mentioned by name or they showed on the screen before we did a kickoff. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you make, I think more than yeah. anything, Brent. It, it, to me, it's a it, that win and the, and the come from behind nature. It validated Peyton's career to get to Atlanta. To win an SEC championship, um, you know, because had he not won that game, um, his career would have, uh, you know, I mean, it would have been unbelievably good. But you know, I think it was the cherry on top that he needed. You know, I mean, obviously he didn't win a national title, um, but you know, he was able to make it to Atlanta and bring home uh, an SEC title before his playing career was over. Yeah, and that's why he came back. I mean, he truly came yeah. back for that game. Rob, to your point, I think Leonard Little's the one of the top, you know two, three defensive ends to have ever played at the University of Tennessee. He's there with uh, Reggie White and, and Derek Barnett was the guy everybody wanted to, com- you know, they wanted to compare Bar- Barnett to Little with all the plays he made. Um, you're talking about Jamal Lewis being one of the best running backs to have ever played at the University of Tennessee, Peyton Manning, the best quarterback. So it wasn't just that they were good in that era, but those three players you mentioned uh, are one are you know, three of the top 10 players, top 15 players to have ever played at the University of Tennessee. Yeah, and, and, and the, I was going to say, we all saw Derek Barnett break Leonard's record, but you know, Derek Barnett, how many games did Derek Barnett need compared to, to what Little did when you factor in you know, him getting here late and playing at middle linebacker? Well, and he lost, he lost half a year in 96 when he tore his knee at South Carolina. You know, I mean, he only he had eight phenomenal. and a half sacks. Yeah, he only had eight and a half sacks that year and would have had more had he not lost you know, four or five games of that season. Jess, I mean, there's no disrespect well, I was, to Barnett, who I, you know, I think was phenomenal discuss this on one of the 96 pods you know the, the one uh with the eddie george in ohio state but just the sheer volume of collegiate talent some of these guys obviously went on to have very storied nfl careers um but this team i mean when you compare it especially to present day with what tennessee's kind of churning out and i think tennessee's draft here in, in 2020 should be much more profitable with with daryl taylor and some of these guys uh, but I mean, on this team alone, Terry Fair gets drafted in the first round. Nash, you know, is a, is a, is a draft pick. You know, Jeff T. Or I mean, uh, T. He was, was a first round draft, draft pick. pick. Yeah, no, Na- Nash was the last pick of the first round of the Denver Broncos. So seventh round and plays. You know, has a long career. But then you have guys again, Darwin Walker. You know, top three round draft pick. Raynon Comp. These guys didn't ultimately have great NFL careers. The Darwin actually lasted a decent amount, but they were all dudes you know where they were top 100 players or whatever in their given season to be drafted that high and it just kind of shows you uh just how stacked these rosters were kind of for these you know uh five six year stretch yeah and the last thing i'll say too about about the talent there 
is more peerless price. He tweeted this out earlier in the week, so I'm, I'm not going to take credit for it, but, I, but he tweeted out and I'm reminded of it watching this game. That dude loved the big stage, man. I mean, he was terrific in the national championship game a year later against Florida state. He was Tennessee's best receiver in this game. Nash made the play. He made the big touchdown play, but peerless price, um, you know, he had one drop in that game, but Peerless would look like he was the most comfortable playing out there at, at the wide receiver position of that game. But, but I mean, Peerless was, you know, Peerless was a re- was a really good player and a guy that Ohio State didn't want because uh, they thought he was a defensive back and he was a guy that Kippy Brown got to visit down here. He got lost on his way for his official visit, yet still decided to to play at Tennessee and uh, went on and had a phenomenal career. Um, at Tennessee and obviously played in the NFL as well. So uh, he jumped out to me in, in this game also. Coming up here on the Rocky Top Rewind podcast, we're going to talk to uh, the man who made the play, Marcus Nash. What was the play call? Uh, what was uh, going through Nash's head at the time? He talks about his struggles early in that game. Talks about that locker room speech as well. That's all coming up here on the Rocky Top Rewind Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast. Again, we thank our friends at Blue Water Climate Control. You can find them at BlueWaterClimateControl.com. You can find them on Twitter at BlueH2O underscore climate. Find out about their smooth sailing service plan. Uh, all the details are online about that. You can get your semi-annual seasonal inspections and perform your routine checks, 10% off parts and labor on all HVAC repairs. You get your diagnostic testing. You get prioritized response to air conditioning repairs and maintenance needs. You can call them today to find out about the smooth sailing service plan. Call them at 865-299-2290. Don't forget to mention VolQuest. That's BlueWaterClimateControl.com today looking at the 1997 uh, SEC championship game against Auburn. Tennessee wins that game in part because of this guy who joins us on the podcast, Marcus Nash. He catches an out and he's gone down the sideline. Marcus, thanks for joining us. Let's talk just a little bit about that game, not just that play, but that game. What what was the week like leading up to that? Because that's that's virgin territory. The program had not been in that place before for that championship game. What was the week buildup like for that game? It was, it was really, it was actually, it was, it was really comfortable. Like we, it, we were really confident in what we were doing. Uh, we put in a lot of different stuff. Like, like we do this, it was very similar to kind of like what we do against, what we did against four. We put a lot of different blitz packages in. We put a lot of different uh, uh, plays in and, you know, that that's basically what Peyton likes to do, but it was real comfortable. We were really, really confident. Like I, I can't even remember uh, like like any kind of like um, any kind of uh, hesitation about how we were going to play. You know, us us winning. It, we were we were pretty confident about everything. When you mentioned the confidence, there, what do you? I mean, you guys were a good team. You knew you were right. a good team. What 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 about that? that game gave you the confidence that, that you had? Was it just that you guys had played well down the stretch and, uh, and you were kind of in a groove? Uh, yeah, and it was, it was one of those things where, like, as far as, like, our, our position groups are concerned, we were, we were re- really confident about the, about the matchups. Like, you know, us against them, uh, you know what I mean? Our, our offensive line matched up with them. They had, you know, a great linebackers. They had to kill spikes back there and everything. But like, as far as, as us against each and every you know, specific, you know, unit against Auburn, we, we were, we, we felt like we were the better team. You were, you were the favorite coming in, Marcus. Auburn came out motivated. Uh, they really gave you their best punch. Um, they and, did. and of course you guys were able to prevail, but I mean, did, did, I won't say did you overlook them because I don't think that's fair, but at the same time, were you expecting the punch that Auburn threw because they threw a good one? I think if, when I think about it, like and during the game, it was one of them shell shock things where like I think we had like nine turnovers or something like that. It was it was an unreal amount of turnovers, and we were like like what is going on? I mean, I I think in my career I've maybe fumbled in a game, maybe two or three times and I had like almost two fumbles during the game we lost one like it was it was one of those things where man like I like we were like you know they they came to play and I don't know like like we P 
people talk about when people overlook teams. Like I don't, I we don't feel that as as actual athletes in the way they prepare. Now, yeah, we we're a little bit overconfident, but sometimes like during the games, things happen, and and you're not, and you know depending on what type of team that you are, you either overcome those, either you can you know you have the veteran leadership, you have the players to overcome it, or you don't. And it was just one of those things where we had enough players on both sides of the ball to make plays when it mattered the most. So talk about the atmosphere in that one. I mean, obviously, Nealon's its own special, uh, you know, special place. But, you know, the fact that, as Brent said, Tennessee was in Atlanta for the first time. Mm-hmm. there, And then Auburn's, you know, a short drive to Atlanta. So, uh, you know, a, a real raucous atmosphere that night in Georgia Dome. Because it, it, it was it was the first time we've actually been in like the Georgia Dome like that, and we were excited like from the with the turf we were, we 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 felt fast so it wasn't it wasn't like one of those things where we were overwhelmed by the by the whole you know the atmosphere of the Georgia Dome or the hometown because you know we had people all they had to do was travel you know six hours down the road or four or five hours down the road so it was like we we could have. We could have people, just as many people there as, as Auburn did, but uh, it was it was we were excited about we we were excited we felt that we could be fast and we were fast and it, it was it was it was it was just one of those things where you know we weren't it, it weren't too big for us like the the atmosphere wasn't too big you know the the situation wasn't too big because we were. We were we were a veteran group. Like we've been through some some pretty some pretty tough games, but we just felt like, you know, player for player, we were this we were just a better team. So no, it, it was we 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 played in big games before, so that wasn't that wasn't the issue. Marcus, I've got to ask because the stories it's it's kind of like you know somebody says they were at you know it, everybody who says they were at a game would be like four hundred thousand people at a game, or it's a fish tale that the fish has gotten bigger over the years. What was that halftime really like in, in that locker room? Because, you know, that, that story has grown with Leonard and Al and kind of how yeah. uh, halftime went. How was it really? Oh, man, it was it was what they this is what they said. Al went off. LL went off. You know, we were we held each other accountable. We were, you know, us as an offense, you know, we were we weren't as 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 fired up as as you know Leonard and, and Al and them but it was it, it the coaches really didn't have to do that much like we we took it upon ourselves to play like play like we were supposed to play and it it was it it was it was pretty fired up it was pretty spirited and we came out it, it was never a it was never a, a panic for us offensively because we knew we had it and coach cut was really really good at at really adjusting and, and making great adjustments and, and, and for us at the halftime. But we were just like, okay, all we got to do is, you know, Coach Washington, just calm down. Let's take care of the ball. Let's just make the plays when we, we have to make them, and it'll it'll come. So we knew what – we knew how to play football, but it was just one of those things where, like, us as an offense, we just we just had to kind of just settle down, regroup, and, and do what we were supposed to do. Was that the most – was that the most in, intense halftime you, you got you've been part of? Um, yeah, yeah. As far as as what it meant and what was on the line and uh, uh, what was what was on the line and and you know it was our senior year and it was the SEC championship and it was you know it it, it was it was it was the most intense halftime. Now we we've had some. You know where we didn't play that all, play that well, but it wasn't it wasn't nearly as meaningful as as that the SEC championship game because we were we were we played in national champs national televised team uh, not national televised games, but that was that was you know that defined you know our our our, our careers as college football players that you know the season uh, gave us a chance to, to go to you know the national championship and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was it was pretty intense. It was so Marcus, you, you look at this team, you, you kind of fight and claw and scrap your way back into it, or I, as I would just call it, you just you, you, the talent took over in the second half for you guys and you played much better. 
Um, let's go to the play that puts Tennessee out on top. It's a quick out to you. You know, you, you make a guy miss and all of a sudden you're such a long strider. I felt like you took like six steps and you're in the end zone. <laughs> you, when, when you're, when you're heading down the sideline, what's going through your mind and, and, you know, was it a blur or, you know, because you, you know, had such a long way to run, were you able to kind of take in the moment? Well, it, it was one of those things we called a 90. Uh, I remember, I really, it's one of the very few plays I actually remember from start. It, it, actually, Peyton had checked. He had checked. It was it was originally a run play, and then he had literally checked to the quick game, and we got the one-on-one coverage that we won out there because I think they were stacking the box, and it, it was, you know, we checked our, 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 our quick. I think it was a quick hitch. I think it was a quick, I think it was a quick hitch. It was our 90s play. Uh, the guy, you know, he was out there on an island. You know, I was, I've normally, you know, prided myself on, on trying to make at least, and, and that we all did. Like, we all wanted to make somebody miss. And that, that was the thing. And we were, uh, it was making somebody miss and not getting caught. Like, if you got caught at all, you would, you would hear it in, in, the, in the film room, uh, the next, the next film session. But, you know, I just made the guy mix. And just try to get down there as quickly as I can. Once I, you know, once I felt like we were, it, it, it was in, it was it is in the bag. Then I kind of just, you know, looked up and tried to find the family in the stands and 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 ended the game that way. So it, it was it was a super special play. You guys were, you know, so competitive um, to to be able to celebrate and soak all that in, knowing you know you had another game to play uh, with your bowl game, but. To have you know, I've reached the mountain in this conference, which is such a big deal. Um, just take me through what it was like. You know, everybody's you know walking around with those SEC signs, you know, down the post game, the confetti's going everywhere. Um, just just take me through you know the post game and just kind of how you know I won't say relieved, but at the same time jubilant that was. Well, you know, you, you know during the, the 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 previous years, we were always. You know, we were always left with that one short, that game that didn't really work out for us. Obviously, it was the Florida game most of the years, but uh, it was to be able to kind of get over that hump finally and put everything together. It, it was it was pretty special for all of us. I, I think um, really we weren't necessarily relieved. It was that man, we we should have been here. The previous year, we were ranked number one. Like it, it was, it was a bunch of things that, you know, we, you know, we had to kind of, you know, um, uh, what do you mean, get over. Like, so it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily being relieved. It was, it was, it was more like, man, we, we should have been here a long time ago. You know, now we're at, now we're at this opportunity. Yeah, we, it, we were used to bowl games, so we already knew there was going to be another game. It was just one of those situations where not now that this game actually meant something and, and we could, you know, that dream that you, you know, play college football to be in the national championship was finally uh, where we can actually reach out and grab it. So, uh, you know, we were we were happy, you know, we were especially going out the way that we did and we, we, we got you know, at least the SEC championship ring. But uh, our work wasn't finished, and we all understood that. We knew we were going to have another game. Uh, we knew it was this game was was the, the biggest game of of our careers. Marcus, you know that play that that you you know the the hitch that you caught, the timing on uh, on all of that. That's not just that week in the in the making. That's so much extra time that's put in. If I think back to that era and that time. It wasn't like every kid was staying um, all summer for workouts. Not all the right. freshmen were coming in June. But but you guys, with, with Peyton and this offense, you guys really practiced all summer long. If I'm not mistaken, you were almost commuting at times from Chattanooga back up to Knoxville to work out. Can you just talk about the summer commitment that the program and you guys had as an offense and, and, and kind of what all that entailed at that point in your career? I, yeah, we've loved to do it. Like we, it was something that, that wasn't even really told to us as, as mandatory or, or not mandatory. 
It just is just something that we did. We love to get better. All of us, all of us love to. There was very few summer workout sessions or or those summer throwing and those seven on sevens on both sides of the ball. There was very few times where we had people not show up. Like I can't even really think, man, unless they were out of town or, or something like that, which which was which which wasn't. Like, and, I, and I'm really trying to think of any one of us that missed because we were gone. It just didn't happen. We just, we just, all of us wanted to get better. We love to get better. And those throwing sessions were just part of our team as a whole. And especially when, you know, Peyton got there, it's just, it's just a culture that, that he created you you were there and and if you and if you were late or something he would call you like where are you at like you know what i mean it was it wasn't even it wasn't even like uh you can ah, i'm just gonna sleep in or did this this you know this session no nah, he's like where are you at get your ass up here and, and 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 let's go to work like so it was just it was just who we were like all of us from 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 day one one joey can't once you know, once billy and him left joey and it was just Peyton came it was just it was just who we were, and I I love to get better every day. I love to just go out there and and and, and Terry Fair and Tori Noel and, and Corey Gaines and and all of our and Sean Johnson and all those other DBs on the other side of the ball. They just love to get better, and we could we competed against them. At, at, you know, every one of those summer sessions, we loved to get better. We loved it. <laughs> How much of the success in the passing game? I mean, Peyton gets a lot of credit, but you guys just had a, a, a plethora of guys. Whether that was, you know, Joey Kemp, who graduated the year before you did, or or Peerless and Jermaine, who you know, when you graduated after you did. Um, and and you, you, each one of you kind of brought something different to the table. Right. Yeah. It, we we were very diverse in as far as our our the types of receivers that they were. It went from the big, tall Alvin Harpers, the Carl Pickens, and, and, you know, all of those Stanley Morgans, all those kind of guys uh, from, you know, to me and, and Andy and, and Peerless and Jermaine and, and Little Sad and, uh, you know, and all, you know, Dante Stower, and then it went back to the big. So it, it just depends on, on who, 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 what type of recruits that we get. But the culture stays the same. Like, all right. So, so finish your thought. Go ahead. No, that, that's that's it. Okay, I was gonna say enough about football. I want to talk about something that was big prevalent back in the nineties, and that was intramural basketball. Marcus, uh-huh. there were a lot of good, a lot of good players during those days. Andy McCullough, you know, gets a lot of tout as a guy that was really good at intramural yeah. basketball. Uh, a different time. That couldn't happen now. Coaches, the coaches now no. would never let. The players play no. in the real basketball. Right. Where were right. you in the pecking order, and, and 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 how much fun was that part of college? You know what? That was other than the football part. That's what we did. We played in a real basketball. We won. We played. We were. We had dunk contests, and when Stokely had a little basket before it was like what it is now. I don't know what it is. It's like this big thing now, but but basketball is. We all played, and a lot of I could have. I mean, I I like to think of myself as a basketball player first. That that was just happened to be better at football, but I love to play basketball. And Andy was a good player. I I used to guard Andy all the time. You have to get them. You have to get them to tell you what kind of basketball player I was. But I was I was I was a I was a pretty pretty good basketball player. I could jump really high. I was really explosive. So I was. Uh, Andy got the. Andy got all the all the Andy and Jermaine got got the you know got the stars as far as 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 the recognition about basketball but but you know like I could I, I'm 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 and actually Terry Fair was a really Terry good Fair. basketball player too his he brother played really good Utah. basketball yeah he, exactly he, he, yeah he was a really good basketball we were all and that's why you say that we were just talking about the other day but we were all really good basketball players that we could have. At any given, you know, moment or any switch in time, we could have, a lot of us could have been D1 college basketball players. Like, I, if I wouldn't have, you know, I, if I wouldn't have, you know, chose to play football back when I was a freshman in, in high school, 
You know, I would have really worked to be one of those D1 players. So we ha- I mean, we had about about four, five, or six really good D1 basketball that could have went both ways back in the day. Because that's just that's what our generation did. We played all of the sports where now they're playing, you know, they're playing tackle football two seasons and when they're younger and then they have their seven on seven season. So it's not that much. There's not that many two sport kids out there these days, but we played, you know, we were just as excited about basketball as we were, but intramurals, it was, we, we really got into that. We really got in that. And actually they had to kind of ban us from, from intramural basketball at uh at one specific time because we were too competitive and and we were just you know it was it was it was it was one of those things but you know I was I like to get to sit my top you know I was top five on the team I would think I would think so. All right, so you're in Las Vegas these days, Marcus. So what's yes. what's Marcus Nash doing right now? What what are you up to these days? Well, I'm doing strength and conditioning and then uh, uh position training uh, on a, a Nash Performance Training uh, Systems. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, coach Stuckey really made a big, big impact on my life, uh, after college to where I wanted, you know, the biomechanics and, and the kinesiology and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was really, I really got into that and the speed and the strength. And, and cause I, I was, you know, I was in kind of an average strength kid as far as like the weights wise. And, but I was just all raw talent. So uh, I really developed and I really worked on getting to where I was as far as strength and speed and all that kind of stuff. I always had, I always had a little bit of speed, but as far as the strength part is what really, what really captured me. So I'm doing that right now and in position training and working to get, well, working to get into some combine stuff. And I'm just traveling, helping, you know, you know, get some you know, developmental programs off the ground in Arizona and, and, and trying to figure out if, if, uh, if I'm going to open my own gym or there's a, you know, I'm a part of this big program that's coming to Vegas next year. And they're, they're supposed to be uh, bringing me on as the head strength and conditioning guy. So uh, I, there's a lot of, a lot of things in there. And I'm actually, you know, looking to, you know, possibly this year coming back in the coach, then get into a coaching a little bit. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on right now that, that I'm excited about. Well, it's great to catch up with you. Thanks for traveling down memory road with us on that 1997 uh, Auburn championship game. Marcus, we appreciate your time. Good luck to everything that you're doing in Vegas and and wherever it takes you next in the strength and conditioning program. That's going to do it for this edition of the Blue Water Climate Control, VolQuest.com podcast, the Rocky Top Rewind edition.